And so we're just going to go through this conversation that uh, Jesus has with Nicodemus. It's such a, an enlightening conversation, and there's so much here for us to, to look at and to uh, understand. In your, Bi- in your pew Bible, it's on page 1507, if you'd like to read along. In John chapter 3, there in verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. You know, how many times I have just read through that and kind of like, oh, it's just telling you a station, what's that mean? What's that look like? <clears throat> but as I've studied this and learned a lot more about Nicodemus and the, who he was, the first thing we see here is that he is a Pharisee. And being a Pharisee meant a very particular uh, set of beliefs. And they were the ones who were in charge at the time, but the Pharisees had a very strong belief that because of the lineage that they had of back to Abraham, that that alone would give them salvation. That they thought that, that would, they had a divine lineage, if you will, and that simply being a Jew would make him, uh, make him saved. And that's a very important thing to understand because the conversation that when he comes to Jesus, Jesus immediately starts talking about how to enter into the kingdom. And it seems like, why is Jesus talking to him about this? He didn't ask about the kingdom. But Jesus, the Bible tells us just here, and actually in John chapter 2, verse 25, it says, And Jesus had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So when Nicodemus comes to talk to Jesus, he already knew what was in Nicodemus' heart. He He probably has heard of Nicodemus. He probably knew who Nicodemus was. And so he knew what his belief system was and all these things. And so as soon as he comes up to Jesus and starts uh, talking to Jesus, Jesus knows his heart and is answering. He says, well, this is the reality of how you enter into the kingdom of God. So the other thing we see about Nicodemus, in addition to just being a Pharisee, it says here that he is a ruler of the Jews. And that is not just a title that's just applied to anybody. But there, this most likely means that he was part of the Sanhedrin, which is about 70 men who were the rulers over Israel. They were the spiritual, and then because of how Israel works, the de facto leadership of Israel. It would be like a senator or something like that. Where we only have 100 of those. That's kind of who this man was uh, to, in relationship to Jesus and in that day and time. So this was a man of great power and great authority and great influence, and he comes to Jesus. But because of who he is, this is how he comes to Jesus. In verse 2 it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And again, a lot of times I just read over these very quickly, but the language that he uses here is very particular. Remember, this is a very particular man. He is a a very powerful man. And he's coming to Jesus, and what he is saying here, the words that he uses are very carefully chosen. And they're very carefully chosen because he has to be very political in all of his choices and, and all of his dealings. But he says here that we've seen the miracles. He can't deny that. He says, I, I've seen the miracles. I know there's something here. And he's trying to, to prod and to feel out. So what exactly is this that I'm feeling? So he says, Rabbi, which is an honorific that he's giving to Jesus. Here he is, a senator. right? He's a, he's a leader of the Jews. He is uh, already known as a teacher of the people. And yet he's calling Jesus Rabbi. So he's giving him honor right off the bat. And saying, I acknowledge that you are something. I don't know what, but something. And then he says, very interestingly, he says, We know that you are a teacher come from God. Now this phrase, come from God, isn't just necessarily applied to every prophet that comes through. He's saying, as like angels come from God. So he's saying that you are a a rabbi, a teacher. I don't want to say anything more than teacher, because that's all he wants to say. He doesn't want to say that you are the Messiah. He says, we know for sure that you're a teacher. But he says, it seems like you're coming from God. He says, and you have the, the miracles to back it up, that you, what you're saying has to have some kind of bearing in reality. 
And so he's very, very political. The fact that he came at night, the fact that he doesn't quite say he's the Messiah, but he kind of gives all the hints to it. He's kind of asking, like, can I put my trust in you? Can I come to you? In verse 3, uh, we see Jesus' response. And this really shows us Jesus being able to see into the heart of Nicodemus. Jesus, in verse 3, says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And like I said, when you're just reading through, you're like, what? that's not what he asked. Why is he talking about that? Because Nicodemus already had the whole thing figured out in his mind. A Jews at that time thought that there would be a Messiah who would be a warrior king who would come back, overthrow the Romans, and be able to set the people free and would lead the people that way. And he's saying that's not how it is. He says there's something different. Your fundamental understanding of the kingdom is different. It is wrong. You don't get to just be a Jew and then be in the kingdom that I'm establishing. There's something more to it that's going to take from everyone. <clears throat> in verse 4, it says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so again, this shows the, the very carnal nature in the way that Nicodemus thinks that I'm from a divine lineage. So if I have to be born again, he's like, do I go back physically and be born again into the lineage again? He's like, how, how does that work? And Jesus is showing the great flaw that Nicodemus has. A lot of people think that because they are born into something, that that's going to be their salvation. There are so many people that say, well, I was raised in a Christian home. Well, good for your parents, but that has nothing to do with your salvation. You have to make that choice to follow after God as well. And, uh, and that's something that Jesus is teaching Nicodemus here. In verse 5 it says, And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the... Uh, well, we'll stop right there. So he says you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of the water and of Spirit. Well, what exactly is he talking about there? This would not be new news to a Nicodemus. Because there are passages of the Old Testament that talk about this idea of being washed clean. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27, Ezekiel chapter 36, there in verse 25 it says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So even in the Old Testament, when God is speaking to the children of Israel, he speaks to them in this language of, I'm going to wash you clean, that I'm going to give you a new heart, a new spirit, you know, my spirit's going to be in you. So even in the Old Testament, this idea was there. And so Nicodemus should have understood this, should have been ready for this, and shouldn't have been too surprising when Jesus starts telling him these things. But in the New Testament, it's even more, more true and more the case. If you would turn to Titus chapter 3, It's a lot harder. In Titus chapter 3, there in verse 5, and that's on page uh, 1689. And there it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, 
But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the, both the Old and the New Testament talk about this idea of this washing of regeneration uh, and, and having a new a, a spirit within us, having the Spirit of God within us and cleansing us. And so this is a universal idea that God has, uh, has preached and told us and we should have expected and Nicodemus should have expected. And so Jesus says to enter into the kingdom of God, you need to be washed. You need, your, you need a new heart. You need the Spirit of God. Your spirit needs to be cleansed. And he says that's how you enter into the kingdom of God. If you go back then, uh, back now to our passage here in John. In John chapter 3, verse 6, he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So this, he is saying, is a universal truth that here Nicodemus is thinking, well, I have to be reborn into a fleshly body or go back into my mother's womb and come out again. He's like, that doesn't make any sense. And Jesus says, no, you're misunderstanding that you can't, even if you were reborn physically here on earth, that you're still here on earth. You still have a fleshly body. You still have this, the sinful body. You still have all these struggles. That's not going to save you. He says, but instead, if you're reborn spiritually and you have this new heart and you're washed clean, then you have this opportunity of of being renewed. When you are born, you take on the nature uh, of your parents. I mean, each of us has characteristics that are very uh, clearly from our parents. So you can look at maybe your eyes or your hair color or something like that and say, oh, well, that's what my parents had. Or I know my, my mom... My mom has like this exact part of my face right there. It's just like they cut and pasted right, right over it. And, and that's, uh, that's the way it works is we have part of the nature of our parents within us. And so being born again, we would have some of the nature of our parents. But spiritually, that means we would have the nature of God. In verse 7, he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes, so is every spirit whom is born of the Spirit. And so we can't necessarily see when this happens. Uh, we don't see spiritually ourselves being cleansed, our spirit being cleansed. We know that if we are washed in baptism, that we, we, I mean, we can physically see that act. But the spiritual side of things, he says, it's like the wind. We, can't, we don't see it. We don't necessarily understand it but we believe that God has done it because that's what he has promised us that he will do. do. And he says that that's what we need to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In verse 9, Nicodemus now is trying to to grasp and understand this situation. And he says, it says, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? How can these things be? In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? I think this is such an amazing uh, response because it shows us who Nicodemus was. He is called the teacher of Israel. So not only was he has that authority like we talked about as a senator, but he is known as a teacher of teachers. He's the one who's teaching Israel, teaching the nation. And he even missed these things. And at the same time, though, I think it's a great uh, tribute to him that he's here. It's at night, but he's here trying to understand Jesus and his message, which is more than you could say for, for many of the Pharisees at that time. But Jesus basically gives him a, a slight rebuke, and Nicodemus takes it. Nicodemus is right, says, you're right, I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. And he just is quiet the rest of the time. And he is just listening now as Jesus is just downloading the the reality of the situation to him and teaching him everything that he needs to know. Nicodemus has now become the student and under Jesus and is listening to him and absorbing everything he has to to teach him. So we go through this. In verse 11, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify 
what we have seen, and you do not re receive our witness. So Jesus says, we're talking about things that I understand, things that I personally know, and you're just totally missing it. He says, you are completely not understanding the situation at all. He says in verse 12, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now, this is such an interesting, uh, interesting concept because remember, Nicodemus came here feeling out who Jesus was. Is Jesus the Messiah? Is he the one that he should be following? And so he says, listen, I've told you of earthly things. I've talked to you about being reborn and baptism. He said, I've told you about entering into the kingdom of God and what that it looks like. And you're, you're flabbergasted. You're stumped already. He said, what's going to happen when I tell you about things that are in heaven? What, how is that possible? How is it that Jesus, the man, could tell you about something that's happened in heaven? And so this is making Nicodemus think here. Verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. So he says in order for Jesus to understand and tell you about things from, about heaven, that's where he had to come from. And he's also at the same time claiming this title, the Son of Man, which we know is a reference back to the Old Testament, which is this idea of the, it is the Messiah who is the son of man that's who they're expecting and so jesus says i need to tell you about heavenly things and you and i both know that only the son of man could tell you about heavenly things so nicodemus is being political here so is jesus jesus is saying these are the answers you need to to listen you need to uh hear what i'm saying that you need to follow after me <clears throat> but he's saying it in a very uh in a very careful way for Nicodemus to think about. In verse 14 says, And so Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So not only is he telling him that he has come down from heaven, but he also is telling him about how he's going to die. Jesus, again, is foretelling uh, what's going to happen. In the Old Testament, uh, there was uh, fiery snakes that were going around biting, oops, going around biting everyone, and uh, and, and so they've made this snake and they put it on a pillar, and everyone who looked at it, well, they would be uh, healed from that, from looking at that snake. They were putting their trust and their faith in God by doing so, and then they would be healed uh, from that. And Jesus says, in the same way, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up; he's going to be hung up on a cross. And that when you look to him, when you turn to Jesus, that's what we need. And you put faith in Jesus, then you're going to have salvation also. <clears throat> in verse uh, 15, he says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that's what we have to do is turn to Jesus. And that's what he's telling Nicodemus, that he is going to be lifted up. He's telling him about his end. And after that happens, you need to turn and follow Jesus. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think it's so interesting to me that this verse is quoted so often, and yet none of the context around it is ever uh, taught very often at all. And now in verse 17 it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So again, Jesus is teaching Nicodemus what his purpose was. He says, you misunderstood how to enter into the kingdom. You thought that you could just be a, a Pharisee and be of the lineage of Abraham, and that would get you into the kingdom. He says, that's not how you enter into the kingdom, that you need to be washed and regenerated by water and the Holy Spirit. He says, that's how you enter into the kingdom. And now he's saying, my purpose of coming here is not to overthrow the, the Roman Empire, He's but to come and seek and save the lost. In verse 16, excuse me, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In verse 18, he says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
So now Jesus is really taking things home for Nicodemus. Remember, all this is spoken to Nicodemus. He said, listen, Nicodemus, there's gonna, there's, uh, I'm going to be lifted up like the snake of the Old Testament. He says, and God now is, I came to save everyone. But if you reject Jesus and you don't follow after Jesus, then there is no hope for you. You know, and this is not, oftentimes this is such a hard concept for people. But God loves us so much, he's not going to force you to do anything. If you don't want to have a relationship with God, he's not going to force that upon you. He's not going to force himself upon us. Instead, he calls out. He's asking for a relationship from from us and with us. But if we reject him, he's not going to to force himself upon us. Verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. I don't know if Jesus meant anything by this because Nicodemus is coming to him by night. But he says that the people who are going to reject Jesus, it's not because Jesus doesn't have the evidence. Uh, Nicodemus already is coming to him because of the miracles. He already knows that God is backing him up and, and supporting him. He says, the reason I will be rejected by people is because they want to hold on to their sin. They want to continue to live in darkness and hold on to that darkness. In verse 20, it says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And so he tells Nicodemus here at the end, he's already hinted that he is indeed the Messiah. He's already said that you, can't, you have to be saved through Jesus. And then he says, If you're going to reject me, understand the reason that you're going to reject me is because you want to hold on to your sin. You want to continue to live in darkness. And this is pretty much the the conclusion of the conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus, but it had a profound impact on Nicodemus. And through the rest of the career of Jesus' missionary journey uh, through this world, Nicodemus kept an eye on him and watched him to see, to see what he was doing. And if you would turn just a few chapters later, in John chapter 7, in John chapter 7, verses 50 through 52, we see the next uh, uh, section that we find about Nicodemus, where uh, involvement that Nicodemus has in the, in the Bible. In John chapter 7, verse 50, it says, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. So already, this is such an amazing uh, interaction between the Sanhedrin court because we've talked about already that Jesus is going around doing miracles. He's already proven who he was and what he's been doing, what he's been saying. And now the Sanhedrin's just looking at it through their, their political eyes, through their worldly eyes. And they're saying, you know, we need to get rid of Jesus. He's causing trouble. The Romans are going to come smash us and, and destroy us. And so we need to get rid of Jesus. He's causing trouble. And Nicodemus says, wait a second. He has all this conversation in the back of his mind, all that he saw. He says, are we just going to judge him already? And their response to him is they say, look, we know what town he's from. He can't possibly be a prophet because no one's come from that town can be a prophet. Well, he's already proven that he was a prophet. He already proved all of those things through the miracles. And how oftentimes when we present the truth to people in the world... That they say have the same circular logic. We ourselves can have the same circular logic, the same argument. They're like, well, if God really loved us, then He wouldn't have put us in a situation in the first place. And therefore, I don't need to know about God. Well, the only way that you're going to know the answer to that question is if you go and learn about God. And so people put up roadblocks in their minds so that they don't have to listen to God. They don't have to search Him out. They don't have to study and understand Him and learn about Him. And so we need to be very careful that we. Uh, we, that we have the heart like Nicodemus has, 
who's willing to come and search and understand and study and, uh, and to have a conversation rather than just putting up our own mental blocks and uh, not listening to the Word of God. The last place that we find Nicodemus spoken about in Scripture is in John chapter 19. And of course we know that Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin. He was brought before the high priest. They had a kangaroo court. And then they took him to the Romans. And they had Pilate kill him. They had him crucified. And I can't imagine what was going through Nicodemus' mind, remembering that conversation that he had with Jesus so long ago, when he saw that Jesus was going to be crucified, when he probably was looking at Jesus being crucified. And he remembered Jesus saying that, I'm going to be lifted up just like that snake. I'm sure that that uh, had a great impact upon him. And in verse 30, John 19, verse 39, we'll start in verse 38. It says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen and the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are the two that went to Pilate initially, asked for the body of Jesus, and, went, and the two of them went and buried Jesus. And that tells you so much about his opinion of Jesus and who Jesus was. We don't know, unfortunately, from the Bible uh, what happened to Nicodemus, if he actually ever became a Christian or a follower of God, or if he was always just kind of riding that line in the dark. And uh, I, I like to think that this, this scene here at the end of him coming out and, uh, and, and burying Jesus with Joseph of Arimathea may have been uh, the, what it needed for him to be able to come forward and say, yes, I, I, I believed in him. But if not, if that wasn't enough and he was still uh, a secret follower, a secret admirer of Jesus... Man, just wait, it's just a couple days. And you can imagine when he starts hearing the rumors of Jesus' resurrection. And I, I truly hope, and I like to think, that that indeed was all that he needed to be able to follow after Jesus with everything that Jesus had told him about from their conversation. He already knew that Jesus was not going to be a military leader or any of those things because Jesus uh, put those things to rest in his conversation with him. And for us, it's the same way that we look at Jesus and his life and we see the, uh, the, the power that he had and the things that he did, the miracles. The Bible tells us the purpose of miracles was to prove that what the man was saying was true. The purpose of miracles was not just to feed people or heal people, although those were fantastic consequences. The purpose of miracles was to be able to prove that what Jesus was saying was true. That was God uh, giving his seal of approval on Jesus. And of course, his resurrection is the greatest miracle and is the greatest seal of approval on Jesus that we have. And the evidence outside of Christianity, which we're not going to go into this morning, is just amazing uh, that you can say, well, did these men believe that Jesus really did resurrect from the dead? And there's no doubt in anyone's mind who is uh, unbiased uh, against God that, yes, these men believed indeed that Jesus was uh, resurrected. And I can just only imagine Nicodemus hearing about this and seeing these men now preaching the word of God everywhere. And how, how could he not be caught up in that? And, and the 
The apostles themselves had miracles also to prove and back up what they were saying was true. 